Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, good. Well, good morning. Thanks, Dr. Egger, for uh, doing grand rounds this morning. Uh, appendiceal neoplasms is a confusing topic, and Dr. Egger is going to shed some light uh, for all of us on this uh, topic. Thank you. You're welcome. So good morning, everybody. Um, as Dr. McMaster said, we'll talk about appendiceal neoplasms today. I have no relevant disclosures to this talk. So our stated objectives today are to talk about, first, I think probably the most common situation in which these um, appendiceal neoplasms arise, in which they are incidentally discovered at appendectomy. What's going to be very critical as we discuss the management of appendiceal neoplasms is to understand the importance of histologic subtype and grade, and we'll see how that guides our decision-making um, in regards to how we treat this. And then we'll talk about um, the operations we do for appendiceal neoplasms, namely cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, the um, indications and expected outcomes after that operation. So again, we're going to we're going to start with incidentally discovered neoplasms, and then we'll then we'll go on to localized disease, go over the different pathologies that we might see with localized disease, and then talk about peritoneal disease and how we manage that. So this again, the most common situation in which these neoplasms arise is when a patient undergoes an appendectomy for presumed acute appendicitis, and it turns out it's not acute appendicitis. The one question is how often does this happen? And the short answer is not very often. It's sort of hard to get um, data from sort of a longitudinal perspective or a, a nationwide perspective on this because we don't necessarily have like a national registry for non-cancer diagnoses. But here's a nice study of a, nearly 8,000 appendectomies uh, performed in New Zealand over a 20-year period. And 99% of the time, it's appendicitis. Um, However, about 1% of the time, um, the pathology shows something other than appendicitis. The most common incidental pathology when it's not appendicitis would be a carcinoid tumor, and that's about two-thirds of those. Um, the remaining uh, third is typically some sort of malignancy or a benign pathologic finding. Starting with sort of the most benign thing, a, a mucosal. So mucosal is really a radiologic diagnosis, basically just a distended mucus-filled appendix. So a mucosal is not acute appendicitis in that there's not inflammation. So a distended fluid-filled appendix with inflammation would be acute appendicitis, usually caused by any of the number of things like appendicitis. Mucosal in and of itself is sort of a dilated mucus-filled appendix without inflammation. And the question is, why do they have a mucosal, right? And under the microscope, it's because they're obstructed by something, right? So it could be um, obstructed by mucus or infection. And so if there's uh, infection present, mucosal can become acute appendicitis. Mucosal hyperplasia can um, pinch off the outlet of the appendix and cause distension. We may see benign neoplasm, such as a cyst adenoma, as pictured here, or it could be a malignant neoplasm. So again, a mucosal is really a radiologic diagnosis, um, and what's important is the underlying pathology that's causing the mucosal. And so for the treatment of a mucosal, it's simple appendectomy. So um, we will sometimes get patients referred to us who do not have nausea, vomiting, fevers, and right lower quadrant pain, but on a CT scan, they have an incidentally discovered dilated appendix. That diagnosis is a mucosal, essentially, and they need to undergo a simple laparoscopic appendectomy. And as long as there's no neoplasm present, they are done. All right, so here's sort of our the workflow of the way we approach these tumors. And we're going we're gonna to assume no uh, metastatic disease, okay? So we're, we're just talking about localized tumors. All right, so an incidental tumor at appendectomy, we're going to look at the pathology and we're going to figure out what it is. Um, we're going to work from left to right here and talk about carcinoids and variants of carcinoids. And then we'll go over onto the right side of the screen here and talk about the adenocarcinomas. And 
basically in this algorithm, the, the decision that needs to be made is whether a margin negative appendectomy is sufficient or a right hemicolectomy needs to be performed. The reason to perform a right hemicolectomy for basically any pathology is one, margins, and that's, but that's sort of an easy thing to consider. But what we're really getting at when we do colectomies for adenocarcinomas is that we need adequate staging, and so we need the lymph nodes resected. And so we'll talk about the situations in which the risk of lymph node metastases are high enough that we would recommend right hemicolectomy. Okay. So again, focusing on localized disease, let's go through the different pathologies. Neuroendocrine differentiation, again, carcinoid tumors or neuroendocrine tumors are the most common incidental pathology. And that's what we're going to focus on first. So how often do neuroendocrine tumors or carcinoids of the appendix um, occur? The incidence in the United States based on SEER data is approximately two per million. Most of them are diagnosed with local disease, so a little less than half have local disease at presentation. The disease of the middle age with a slight female predominance of about 63%. About a third of patients will have regional disease, and about a quarter of patients will have distant metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. Important to understand that um, of all the appendiceal tumors, um, a, a malignant carcinoid, a neuroendocrine tumor or a carcinoid tumor, is really the most favorable. And, and now what's important you have to understand is when you read that pathology, you're looking for a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. That's what we're talking about when we talk about these carcinoids. Survival is very favorable, and basically survival gets worse the more sort of adenocarcinoma-like you get. Um, and we'll talk about goblet cell carcinoid here in a second, which is sort of in between carcinoid and adenocarcinoma. And then we sort of go through to adenocarcinomas, mucous adenocarcinomas, and finally end up on signet ring cell. So for neuroendocrine tumors, this is a very um, popular topic for the uh, app site and for the boards. Indications for a right hemicolectomy. Any carcinoid tumor greater than two centimeters in general has a risk of lymph node metastases high enough that we would recommend a right hemicolectomy. There's a little bit of a gray area for the one to two centimeters. Um, if it's located at the base, if there's meso invasion greater than three millimeters, KI67 greater than 3%, angio invasion or a positive margin, those would typically be acceptable indications for proceeding with it. Now, understand that when we do a right hemicolectomy, what we're really doing is staging the patient. We're really not improving their survival all that much. Um, that's not to say I want to dismiss the importance of doing a right hemicolectomy because um, untreated nodal disease from neuroendocrine tumors uh, can be fatal if left untreated. Um, but here's the SEER data for localized disease. You can see here five-year survival in excess of 90% for localized disease, but it's about 85% for regional disease. Um, and so, again, what we're trying to do is identify those patients with regional disease. And, and the reason I find that helpful is I think it kind of helps how we follow those patients. You talk about surveillance here in a couple slides. But to kind of put that patient in the category of regional disease means that you follow them a little bit closer, um, get some serial imaging and some tumor markers, and you probably keep a little bit of a closer eye. It sort of sets the tone, sets the expectations for what the patients can expect, that it's not necessarily something that they can just kind of forget. So in CDB data, um, is interesting to kind of get a snapshot of how tumors are being treated in the United States. Um, it's, you can't really tell why, but you can kind of get an idea of, of general trends and how people are treating tumors. So here is the percent of cases managed with a formal hemicolectomy based on tumor size. So the vertical axis is the percentage of patients undergoing a hemicolectomy. On the x-axis is tumor size in millimeters. So you'll see the gray box there is that one to two centimeters, right? So first it's important to note that you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of carcinoids less than a centimeter are managed with a right hemicolectomy. Now, you got to understand what that probably means is that they underwent a right hemicolectomy for some other reason and um, had an incidental carcinoid found at appendectomy. I don't think that 
40% of patients with an 8 millimeter carcinoid are undergoing a right hemicolectomy after an appendectomy. So you have to understand the limit. You can see once you get greater than uh, 20 millimeters, greater than 2 centimeters, about 70 to 80 percent of patients are undergoing what we would imagine, what we would recommend. And you can see here it just kind of goes from 50 percent to 70, 75, 80 percent, kind of creeps up there in that 1 to 2 centimeter. So I think this shows us that people are being thoughtful about how they approach these tumors. Um, the closer you get to 2 centimeters, the more likely that surgeons are to recommend a hemicolectomy. Again, it's hard to tease apart whether these patients had um, a right hemicolectomy at the very beginning or whether this was a right hemicolectomy after an appendectomy. Now, so again, we, as I mentioned before, we are not necessarily treating these patients or improving survival, let's say, for these indeterminate carcinoids. So here, looking at those same data, this one to two centimeter carcinoids, this is a survival comparison of those who underwent a primary resection versus those who underwent hemicolectomy, primary resection being an appendectomy only. You can see here that the survival is exactly the same. So again, the, the reason to do a right hemicolectomy is to identify lymph node metastases. I think it stratifies patients for surveillance, gives them an understanding of their disease process, and it gives them the appropriate. So what do we do afterwards? Well, the NCCN um, is helpful in some areas and not helpful in others. So the recommendations for an, an appendiceal carcinoid less than two centimeters after an appendectomy is as clinically indicated. Um, and so it kind of means up to you. Um, I will typically not do anything with them. I may follow them if there are any of those um, adverse features and we didn't do a, a right hemicolectomy for any reason. Um, I may see them annually for a couple of years, but in general, the less than two centimeters uh, probably do not need any surveillance. You do a right hemicolectomy, you basically fall into the GI neuroendocrine tumor guidelines. Again, they kind of offer you um, a range, but this is where I think the lymph nodes help. So I would generally say if you do a right hemicolectomy for a two centimeter carcinoid greater than two centimeters, I typically will see them in a year and yearly thereafter for a couple of years with biomarkers and imaging. For those with lymph node metastases, I'll make that first follow-up in six months. So do six months and a year, and then go on to a year after that. And then, um, you know, we may space out imaging. Again, if they were lymph node negative, we may be um, a little um, uh, more strict, or we might we might use imaging less often than if they had positive lymph nodes. Goblet cell carcinoids are called adenocarcinoids. They're basically somewhere between a pure neuroendocrine carcinoid and a, a glandular adenocarcinoma. Pathologically, they're somewhere in between, and therefore their outcomes are somewhere in between carcinoid and adenocarcinoma. And the more sort of adenocarcinoma-like they are, the more like their adenocarcinoma and the worse their outcomes are. This group, the groups here are one to four based on degree of glandular differentiation. So again, a goblet cell carcinoid with just a little bit of gland formation that looks mostly like a neuroendocrine tumors in group one, the prognosis is more favorable than those that are more adenocarcinoma-like. From a test question and from a treatment standpoint, um, goblet cell carcinoids, you don't have to think. They all need a right hemicolectomy regardless of size, whether it's at the tip, base, you know, angio invasion, things like that. Um, again, they're just a little bit more like adenocarcinoma, so the, so the recommendation is because they have higher rates of lymph node metastases that a goblet cell carcinoid resected at incidental appendectomy should undergo a right hemicolectomy. And then if they have node positive disease or if they have metastatic disease, um, they're usually treated with more of a colorectal type chemotherapy, a full fox based chemotherapy, rather than um, neuroendocrine chemotherapy, which kind of doesn't exist if you think about it. Uh, neuroendocrine chemotherapy is usually really just sort of anti-hormonal therapy or for really aggressive neuroendocrine tumors, they're platinum-based chemotherapy. Okay, so back to our algorithm. Again, if there's a component of neuroendocrine differentiation, you want to find out if it's a well-differentiated pure carcinoid. If it is, your, your two centimeter size is going to be your criteria. If it's less than two centimeters with favorable pathology, you're just going to do a margin negative appendectomy. If it's greater than two centimeters or any of the aggressive pathologic features we mentioned, a right hemicolectomy would be indicated. For a goblet cell carcinoid, a right hemicolectomy is the treatment. 
So now we've talked about the neuroendocrine tumor. So now what do you do with an appendiceal neoplasm that is classified as a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm? For the sake of um, everybody's time, we'll call them lamins from here on out. So let's talk about lamins. Lamins are probably the most common um, incidental finding that I get referred to me. Um, I think a lot of folks, a lot of the general surgeons in the community kind of feel comfortable taking care of carcinoids. The indications for what to do are clear. I think the lamins are a little bit more of a gray area. Um, so lamins are, are neoplasms with low-grade cytologic atypia with any of these sort of following abnormal pathologic features in which the muscularis mucosa could be obliterated. There's fibrosis of the submucosa. They have what, these path, what the pathologists describe as a pushing invasion. If you see acellular mucin in the wall or outside of the appendix, um, those are all signs of a lamin. Now, importantly, so patients ask me, like, so do I have cancer if you have a lamin? And, and, and like, technically, it is not an invasive malignancy. It is not captured in SEER or other cancer registries as such. Um, uh, one patient asked me if they, you know, could activate their, you know, cancer insurance policy because they had a lamin. And as far as I could tell, I don't think so. Um, they're Typically, they do not have the ability. A lamin does not spread to the lungs or spread to the parenchyma of the liver. But... That's sort of the paradox of lamin. While they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily a cancer that can spread outside the abdomen, they can develop pseudomyxoma peritonei. They can develop unresectable carcinomatosis just as bad as any invasive adenocarcinoma of the GI tract. And so that's sort of the what I think could be interesting about treating these. Most lamins are localized, not a big deal, but they can they can cause peritoneal spread with just as um, devastating a consequences as any of the other malignancies. So they're not really a cancer, but they do have an AJCC B category. Um, they're basically either T3s or T4s based on their invasion, the depth of their invasion. So what do we do? How do we treat them, right? So again, we're talking about localized disease. We're not talking about spread to, um, spread, of the, spread of the peritoneum. A margin negative resection is in general the treatment of choice. Um, and again, if you if the margin is positive at the base of the appendix, then they do need a, a margin negative resection, which would typically be a right hemicolectomy or an ileocecectomy or something like that. If it's a pure lamin, there the risk of lymph node metastases is zero. They do not spread to the lymph nodes, so again, you would just need a margin negative resection. What to do afterwards, I think, is a, is interesting. Um, some folks advocate. Um, serial tumor markers, CT scans. And so here's a study that was published about five years ago in which every patient with a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, this is a small study, it's about 20 patients, but their general treatment was they got a CT scan at the baseline and tumor markers, CEA, CA125, and CA199. And in six months, they repeated that. They repeated a CT scan and tumor markers. And they did that six months later again at a year. So what's interesting is at a year, if they still were negative with tumor markers and they had a normal imaging, they still all underwent a diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, and then they will see the kind of results of what they found. And so in patients who had a routine diagnostic laparoscopy with low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm one year after diagnosis, in about 25% of patients, they found um, additional disease. Um, so in five patients, they found additional disease. One of those five, a CT scan showed disease, and that prompted a laparoscopy. But four of those five had no disease on CT scan, and when they looked inside, they found disease. Those patients then underwent a HIPAC. Now, the alternative to that is just your surveillance. And so now here's another study um, with 43 patients. And this, uh, this is a European study, and they had patients who had a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. They had a PCI of three, or disease confined to the right lower quadrant or pelvis. They had a margin-negative tumor resection, and their tumor markers and scans were all negative. They basically got CT scans and tumor markers every six months for five years and then annually thereafter. So this is, so no plain laparoscopy, but a fairly aggressive tumor marker CT scan 
regimen of getting scans and tumor markers every six months for five years and annually thereafter. And so with 43 patients with a median follow-up of essentially five years, two patients, only two patients recurred. Um, those two patients had very low PCI. One underwent uh, cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC and did fine. One refused a cytoreductive surgery and did fine. Thank you very much. So um, you sort of have two approaches here. And it's, I think was, you know, if you, go looking for disease with a diagnostic laparoscopy, you may very well find disease. And what that one study from Foster told us is, as many as a quarter of patients may develop sub-radiographic disease or radiographically occult disease over, over a period of time. But what this second study tells us is that, you know, you know if, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, does it make a sound, right? Like, if you have sort of disease in there, but it doesn't ever reach the spectrum of radiographically apparent, it's not clinically apparent, and it's likely never going to be a problem. So just conceptually think about it like this. You know, even if we take if we take both of those studies as being truth, you know, 75% of them may kind of develop some smolder along, but really will never have detectable disease. Right, and so only about 25% of them will ever reach the threshold for sort of biochemical or laparoscopically apparent disease, but really only about 5% will ever reach the threshold for radiographic disease. So again, this is a very indolent, slow-growing tumor, and so are, are, you know, some people, are you looking for trouble if you stick a scope in and find it? Um, the counter-argument to that is, untreated lamin who, that develops pseudomyxoma peritonei and, and progresses to carcinomatosis can become, again, just as debilitating and just as unresectable as any GI malignancy. Um, and so this is a bit of the diagnostic dilemma on how we follow these patients. Are there any clues as to those that are higher risk lamins? And certainly if there's perforation, if there's mucin in the wall, serosa or outside of the appendix pathologically, um, the MD Anderson pathology folks describe a, a lamin of uncertain malignant potential, a lump, um, and their criteria for that include perforation of the appendix, mural fibrosis, what they call, they're calling dissecting mucin pools, which is where you have these mucin pockets within the walls of the appendix, and then acellular mucin in the parapendiceal soft tissue. These patients are at a little bit higher risk of developing metastases. The other thing um, that you can do are the, the utility of tumor markers. So this is a study of patients who presented to um, MD Anderson after an incidental appendectomy with a lamin, and they drew tumor markers at the time. So this is not like when they actually still had their appendix in place, this is after their appendectomy. And if you had an elevated CEA or an elevated CA125, your risk of developing a recurrence um, was much higher than if your tumor markers were normal at the time of it. So I do think tumor markers can be helpful. So what I generally do, um, I think the first thing is I, I talk to the surgeon who refers these um, patients to me, and I you, you try to get an idea as if they if they saw any mucin outside of the appendix, did they get a good look at the abdomen? And, and usually you don't because you're in there to get the appendix out, and it's not like you do a good a, you know a full four quadrant surveillance of the abdomen. But if there's no evidence of uh, acellular mucin or mucin outside the appendix, the and there's no high-risk fe uh, features. I typically get tumor markers at six months. They usually will have already had a CT scan, right, because they had a CT scan for their appendicitis. Um, so I'll get another scan and tumor markers in six months and then scan and tumor markers in a year. If they don't have any problems in a year, it just depends on, on their kind of anxiety and what we want to do. I, I usually then say they don't need any follow-up. Um, or if they want to have follow-up, maybe we'll start doing MRIs every year or two with tumor markers. If they do have higher risk features, if their tumor markers are elevated, I would consider a, a diagnostic laparoscopy in one year. Again, with the intent of identifying radiographically occult disease early, um, there is a big difference in doing a HIPEC in a patient who just needs a little right hemicolectomy and cleaning out a little bit of mucin than somebody who needs an extensive debulking operation. So. You know, importantly, and the reason I feel okay about letting these patients go after a year or two is that they at least know that they have this disease process. They know what to look for. We talk about bloating, cramping, abdominal pain. Um, you know, 
I have yet to be burned. I've not been doing this very long, but I've yet to be burned by losing control of this disease when we sort of let, you know, kind of let patients out of the surveillance pathway. So I think once they sort of know about it, I do think they're a little bit more aware. So again, a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm just needs a margin negative appendectomy. There's no evidence of metastatic. Let's now talk about the adenocarcinomas, um, the appendiceal adenocarcinomas. All right, so these are cancers, all right? No doubt about it. These are adenocarcinomas. It's important to understand if they're mucinous or non-mucinous, and the histologic grade is incredibly important in the management. of Again, adenocarcinomas are defined by invasion, and so these by definition have invasion. Now the book answer and what the app site will do every once in a while to trip people up is they'll give you a 1.1 centimeter, uh, well, adenocarcinoma of the tip of the appendix. And if you're not watching things carefully, you'll see 1.1 centimeters and you'll think carcinoid and you'll think you don't have to do it. The book answer is, excuse me, is that that patient needs a, a right hemicolectomy. However, I will point out that if you if you want to be a little more nuanced in how you evaluate things, well differentiated appendiceal adenocarcinomas, especially mucinous adenocarcinomas, their risk of developing lymph node metastases for T1 or T2 and even T3 disease is very very low. And so, for somebody with a well differentiated mucinous adenocarcinoma who does develop carcinomatosis, um, they don't. I would not necessarily say that they need a right hemicolectomy to clear their lymph nodes if you don't need to do it to clear their disease. So again, the risk of lymph node metastases in well-differentiated mucinous adenocarcinomas is pretty low. But again, the book answer is they need um, a right hemicolectomy. In general, the mucinous and non-mucinous, here's just sort of overall, all stage, the survival is the same. It's signet ring cells, just like anything. Signet ring cells are bad. Same with appendiceal cancer. Again, grade manners matters. Um, well differentiated has better prognosis than moderately or poorly differentiated. Mucinous versus non-mucinous, if you if you separate it out a little bit for stages one through three, basically stage one mucinous and non-mucinous, which are like the blue and the yellow lines here, they're pretty similar. Here's the stage two mucinous, non-mucinous, and here's the stage three mucinous, non-mucinous. So those are all pretty much the same, okay? So you can consider mucinous and non-mucinous pretty similar. But note that for stage four peritoneal metastatic disease, mucinous um, appendiceal adenocarcinoma is much more favorable than non-mucinous. Non-mucinous appendiceal adenocarcinoma is basically colon cancer, and I would think of it as such and treat it as such with regards to um, operative resection of the primary and indications for uh, HIPAC and things like that. All right, going back to our algorithm again, moderately and poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma and well differentiated adenocarcinoma. The book answer is they need a right hemicolectomy. I, I have a little overlap here when we talk about a margin negative appendectomy for a well differentiated adenocarcinoma. The right patient, um, their, their risk of lymph node metastases is low enough that you might be able to forego a um, right hemicolectomy. Again, all of this is assuming no evidence of metastatic disease. Okay, so we've spent the first half talking about localized disease. Now let's consider peritoneal disease or disease that is spread to the peritoneum. Discuss the diagnosis of this um, malignancy, the treatment, and expected outcome. Starting first with diagnosis. Um, typically, you know, the presentation varies. It's usually vague. It's sort of a vague abdominal pain. Um, a lot of times they'll have this sort of this, they'll have like weight loss, but they're but they have increasing abdominal girth, right? So they're like, I'm not eating well, but I'm I'm I seem to be gaining weight. My pants don't fit anymore, but actually, when I get on the scale, I'm losing weight, right? And so the first thing you want to do when you get these scans, and again, look, the coronal view is your friend when you're looking for the appendix. You see this mucin stuff. You want to look at the coronal view. You want to see if you can identify an abnormal. So just like any cancer, the next thing to do is to diagnose it, um, and you need to get a biopsy of it. Um, for most of these patients, um, percutaneous biopsy is adequate. You can get tissue. Pathologic diagnosis is critical, um, and this is where um, 
where our the approach difference from GI malignancy versus um, GYN malignancies, a lot of times uh, for GYN oncologists will proceed with um, surgery and debulking without a, a preoperative diagnosis. However, for higher grade tumors, if their suspicion is for higher grade tumors, they will get a biopsy. Um, I will pretty much try to never go into an operation without knowing what we're getting into with a biopsy. The typical area that you're going to biopsy is the omenta. So this kind of the gray area here, this is mucinericides. The sort of darker gray area right adjacent to the transverse colon is the omentum. This is usually pretty easily radiographically apparent. You can get a nice core needle biopsy that's either CT or ultrasound guided. You get plenty of tissue for tumor markers. If, however, you cannot get a, um, a percutaneous biopsy, a uh, diagnostic laparoscopy is perfectly appropriate um, to get in there and get as much tissue as you can. So staging, you certainly get a CT um, abdomen and pelvis. Certainly, I would get a CT chest. Tumor markers are helpful, CEA, CA99, and CA125. And yes, we check CA125 in men um, because CA125 can be elevated in men with peritoneal disease. Then you sort of have to kind of, you know, figure out the patient's um, nutrition status, performance status, and comorbidities because these, um, these patient factors are going to play a critical role in, in how you decide to treat these patients. Again, pathology, the pathologic grade drives disease prognosis and how we treat these patients. So it's critical that you get a good pathologic analysis of this. Um, if it needs to be sent for a second opinion or something like that, that's perfectly appropriate. Um, so on the, um, on the, what we, you know, the ways we can, different ways we can categorize peritoneal disease. Mucin without epithelial cells is typically called acellular mucin. So a lot of times we'll just get acellular mucin. They'll have mucin in there, but there's no cells in there. That's a very favorable prognosis. Uh, PMP is a pseudomyxoma peritoni with low-grade histologic features. This used to be called uh, DPAM, disseminated peritoneal adenomucinosis. Um, a more favored term now is low-grade mucinous carcinoma peritoni. This is, this is basically lamin that spreads to the peritoneum is the way I think about it. So when a lamin spreads to the peritoneum, you get this disseminated peritoneal adenomucinosis, this DPAM, or what we would now call low-grade mucinous carcinoma peritoneum. So again, lamin can spread to the peritoneum and can cause pseudomyxoma peritoneum. The next is high-grade, so high-grade mucinous carcinoma or peritoneal mucinous carcinomatosis. Again, the distinguishing feature there we used to call it adenomucinosis. Notice there's no carcinoma in there. Um, this is really the more classic, well, um, potentially well differentiated or poorly or moderately differentiated appendiceal adenocarcinoma with mucin. And then again, if it has signet ring cells, that gets its own category. Pathologically, this is what acellular mucin looks like. It looks like mucin without cells. Low-grade mucinous carcinoma peritoneal or the diffuse peritoneal adenomucinosis, you have these very bland-looking cells here that are not invasive, but they're certainly the source of the mucin. Higher-grade tumors, you're starting to see glandular differentiation here. You're starting to see the cells stack up. This is a more aggressive malignancy. And then signet ring cells, uh, you can see, again, stacked up, more aggressive-looking epithelial cells. Here, they're not even really forming glands anymore, and that's a sign of de-differentiation. Okay, so we've diagnosed these patients. We've given them an appropriate pathologic grade. We've kind of um, assessed their performance status. How do we treat these, right? We've determined the grade. You want to kind of estimate the disease burden and the degree of cytoreduction that you can, um, can, that you can expect, and then you have to decide whether they need neoadjuvant therapy. So again, grade is incredibly important. So mucin without epithelial cells, again, that's that acellular mucin. Um, this is after surgery, their survival is basically fine. So those, these patients have a very favorable prognosis. As you work your way down, again, DPAM, again, think of DPAM as lamin that has spread to the peritoneum. Then you start getting into the adenocarcinomas you see as the grade increases, survival decreases. Again, histologic grade is critical. Well differentiated mucinous appendiceal adenocarcinoma is still very, very favorable. These may, may fall into that DPAM category. Moderately or poorly differentiated, again, much worse with regards to survival.
So we use a semi-quantitative way to estimate the disease burden called the peritoneal cancer index or the PCI. Um, you basically kind of divide the abdomen up into a tic-tac-toe board. So you have nine quadrants, which is not technically a quadrant, but you have nine areas um, and then the upper and lower bowel the bowel, the small bowel gets four different areas so the upper and lower jejunum and the upper and lower ilium that gets you 13 um, areas that get a score of zero to three um, a one is tumors up to five millimeters a two is five millimeters to five centimeters and three is five centimeters or confluent that so you can get a score of zero to 39 um, so this is the way we estimate the disease the disease burden and then we grade our cytoreduction. We have a CC completeness of cytoreduction score. CC0 is when you get all the disease out. A CC1 is less than two and a half millimeters. And we'll talk about why we choose that two and a half millimeter cutoff. A CC2 is when we get anywhere from two and a half millimeters to two and a half centimeters. So up to an inch of tumor. CC3 is basically when we leave big bulky tumor behind. What we're shooting for in most cases are a CC0 or one. So in general, your criteria for doing a high PEC, um, again, depending on, we'll talk about the difference in the pathologies. In general, if you think you can get to a zero or one, that in general is uh, means you would kind of take a run at it. Um, so we can use some radiographic criteria to estimate our ability to get a uh, complete cytoreduction. So here's, um, we look for scalloping of the liver, spleen, pancreas, and portal vein. We can handle scalloping. Um, what is really the problem is mesenteric small bowel foreshortening, okay? So here's a couple examples here, right? So um, this is just sort of diffuse ascites or mucin, but there's not really any sort of scalloping of the, of the liver or spleen. Here you can start seeing what we call the scalloping of the liver, right? These are a little bit more, these are gonna be some more stuck on kind of implants. Here you can see some scalloping kind of up in the porta hepatis here. That's a little trickier to get off. Here in the spleen, a little trickier to get off here. Um, you want to look at the pancreas. There's a little there's a little scalloping of the pancreas here. So you get a point for all of these. But what we really want to know is is whether the mesentery is foreshortened. And you've got to kind of it's sort of a gestalt as far as how you look at these scans. You want to see the small bowel sort of floating with a freely untethered soft mesentery like you see here on the left in screen A. What you don't want to see is this sort of cauliflowering kind of retraction of the small bowel mesentery. Um, this means that that mesentery is full of tumor and, and you cannot take the small bowel mesentery because you cannot take the whole small bowel. So this sort of simplified uh, radiographic score, if you had a score of three or more, um, it had a very high positive and negative predictive value of who was able to get a complete cytoreduction. So again, when do we offer a cytoreduction in HIPEC? Again, based on histology, the expected degree of cytoreduction, and the patient. For lamins with that diffuse peritoneal adenomucinosis or low-grade appendiceal adenocarcinomas, basically anybody probably benefits, no matter the PCI, even if you can't get it all out, any medically fit patient will benefit from it. You'll dry up their ascites, you can debulk their disease, and usually benefit the patient. For moderately and poorly differentiated, uh, I, I'm a little bit more hesitant about these. If they have an elevated PCI, and we, we call a high PCI of greater than 15 or 20, those patients have poorer prognosis. Um, and that's a situation in which you might recommend neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, we're going back to that slide. I showed this slide earlier. Again, grade matters, well differentiated, very, very um, favorable prognosis, moderately and poorly differentiated, less so, but you know, moderately, is a category in and of itself for a reason, right? It's sort of in between well and poorly differentiated. This is looking at moderately and poorly differentiated appendiceal adenocarcinoma. If they had a PCI score of greater than 20, you see that their overall survival was much worse than if they did. And um, this is um, data from MD Anderson, so it's a neoadjuvant chemotherapy study. And so patients who had a response or stable disease in response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to cytoreduction, they did better than those who progressed. And again, basically the ones who progressed would not be offered a high pick. So we're, we're sort of extrapolating whether chemotherapy works in these patients um, based on adjuvant data. So here's SEER data for adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, 
you know, if you if you sort of tease out, apparently here's mucinous, moderately differentiated, and uh, the higher curve is those that got chemo adjuvantly. The lower red curve is those that are those that did not. Um, I, you know, I guess there is a technically a difference here, but you can see it's not much. Here's poorly differentiated again, depending on if you're a medical oncologist or a surgical oncologist, you can interpret these curves differently. What I think it's very clear is that well differentiated uh, appendiceal adenocarcinoma does not respond to chemotherapy. It's barely a cancer, and so chemotherapy designed to kill fast growing cells does not work very well for slow growing well differentiated appendiceal. So there's really no role for chemotherapy in the well differentiated tumors. So again, if somebody has well differentiated appendiceal um, mucinous adenocarcinoma, they have that DPAM, that diffuse peritoneal adenomucinosis. Um, uh, I would typically offer them a high pec if they're medically fit. When they have moderately or poorly differentiated, um, I would typically offer them neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, and then assess them after their neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a diagnostic laparoscopy. It's a little more difficult to assess a PCI laparoscopically, but you can do it relatively well. Any, if they're a patient with a less than a 15 and I think I can get them to a CC0 or 1, um, then I think it's reasonable to offer them a high pec but if they have a high disease burden, if you don't think you can get them down to a CC0 or 1, then they may not benefit. There are other centers that disagree with this, though, and it would be more aggressive. And these are uh, data from a consortium, um, mostly data from Pittsburgh and Wake, but a couple other centers as well. And this is looking at high-grade appendiceal adenocarcinoma, and they maintain that the PCI does not matter. And they're showing data here, so for PCIs of 20 and 25 or greater, median survivals on the order of four and a half years. But what's important about this and the distinction between this and well differentiated disease is actually you don't get the benefit of a CC1 sort of, well, I almost got all the disease out and we'll let the chemo mop up the rest. That doesn't work with high grade lesions. So see here, the CC0s are the ones that do well, but if even if you leave a millimeter of disease behind, they do just as poorly as if you left a big chunk of tumor. And so I think what's critical when you're looking at a high grade or moderately differentiated patient, you have to be able to get all of it out. And if you don't think you can get all of it out, you can't count on chemotherapy to mop it up. We'll show you the curves. We'll show curves at the end of this talk where the CC0 and the CC1 curves are superimposed. That's for the more well differentiated favorable tumors. And that's the distinction we have to make between well differentiated and poorly differentiated. So what is involved with the treatment of this? So we call it a cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. So cytoreductive surgery is, is removing all the cancer. And this means a complete omentectomy. You remove all of the omentum from the entire transverse colon along the hepatic flexure, along the splenic flexure. And then you do a peritonectomy and resection of involved organs only. Um, I, I do not, I, most of my partners, most of us don't practice sort of routine stripping of, of the peritoneum, but you basically take out whatever it is you need to take out. And oftentimes it's in the pelvis, so oftentimes um, a hysterectomy or bilateral salpingal oophorectomy is, is needed. Um, an upper rectal resection is often needed, but again, these are peritoneal-based tumors, and so you don't necessarily have to do a full low anterior resection down to the levators. Once you basically get below the peritoneal reflection, you're free and clear. Gastrectomies are often um, an area where the tumors like to stick. Uh, diaphragms are often where the tumors like to stick. Um, bladder is also an area where you may have to resect. The diaphragm, you can usually strip it. You usually don't have to resect unblocked tissues of diaphragms. However, if the disease is full thickness, you'll know it because as you're trying to strip that diaphragm away, you get into the pleural cavity. To me, that means that was a full thickness thing. I don't think that's necessarily a technical error. Um, it just means that that disease was full thickness. Um, and um, so you may end up resecting a piece of diaphragm for that. So HIPEC for appendiceal, um, for appendiceal adenocarcinomas, appendiceal neoplasm, the treatment of the chemotherapy of choice is mitomycin C. Uh, you can either do it in a flat dose of 30 milligrams. You can do a flat dose of 30 with a boost of 10 milligrams at the end of the high pack, or you can do a body surface area based uh, dosing. The theory behind chemotherapy is that it penetrates up to three millimeters of tissue. That is why we have that CC1 cutoff of two and a half millimeters. 
the rationale being that anything less than two and a half millimeters will be treated by the perfusion by the chemotherapy. Toxicities associated with the chemotherapy, um, you can get some bone marrow suppression. Um, you can get some pneumonitis, especially if you end up perfusing the chest. So in the, in the instances in which we have full thickness involvement of the diaphragm, when I end up taking out a chunk of diaphragm, I leave the diaphragm open to perfuse the chest because my rationale is that that, that was a full thickness injury and they're at risk of failure in the chest. Um, you have to put chest tubes in, obviously, for that, and they can get some pneumonitis. Um, you know, in general, the bowel do not like hot chemotherapy pumped into them at high doses. And nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, ileus, prolonged GI dysfunction is really the, the main problem that we have with this operation. The systemic toxicities are rare. Um, the local toxicities are quite real. All right, so why do we do, why do we heat it up? Um, well, the, the rationale, the theory is that getting up above 41 degrees, 40, 41 degrees, you activate some heat shock proteins, which um, will not only sort of cause some indirect tumor destruction, but it'll sort of augment um, the effect of the chemotherapy as well. So, and again, we're not getting up to like 45 degrees. We're actually cooking the cells. That's not the, we're not trying to cause thermal injury to the cells. We're causing what they call thermosensitization, right? It's sort of like giving a radio sensitizing chemo, like Zalota or something like that when you're getting radio. Um, so we all use a closed technique here. There is such a thing called an open or coliseum technique, which is where the abdominal wall is just tinted out with the Thompson dump the chemo in and you literally just circulate it with your hand. So that that seems seems like there's a lot of uh, opportunity for contamination and splashing with that. So we used a closed technique and, and you might argue that there's still a lot of opportunity for contamination and problems with that. And I would not disagree. We typically shoot for an outflow of 40 degrees Celsius and we kind of go with whatever inflow temperature we need for an outflow of 40 degrees. Um, we typically get about a flow rate of a liter. Once we hit all that, we start shaking, and we do this for 90 minutes um, for mitomycin C. What I tell the patient is that it's an all-day operation. Um, I basically tell them it's not whether they'll get a complication, it's what kind and how bad. Um, risk of a, of a complication is probably on the order of, of 50 to 75 percent. The risk of a serious complication requiring a reoperation or a life-threatening issue is lower, um, but there's a real mortality on the order of three to five percent for this operation. They're in the hospital for seven to ten days at least, um, and there's really a six to nine month decline in their quality of life. It takes a long time to get over this operation. Briefly talk about some of the outcomes we can expect with this operation. So these are big centers. Uh, Europe's really, Europe's the place to go, basically, to kind of learn and think about HIPEC. They're very aggressive with HIPEC. They, they have publish a lot, and we get a lot of good data from Europe. Um, this is, you know, importantly, though, when you talk about, look at these HIPEC papers, you have to look at the histology. So it's sort of like sarcoma literature. Um, to get numbers, we often lump together a bunch of different pathologies, but it's really important to tease out the different pathologies. So these are just general broad kind of reports of center experiences. Here you can see their differences in CC zeros, and this is probably a reflection of how aggressive they are in the underlying histology. They define major complication rates here on the order of 20 to 30 percent. Mortalities on the order of 2 to 4 percent. Length of stay, one center reported it on about two months. But survival is very good. Overall and progression-free survival is very, very good in these general, in these general series. This is what I wanted to point out here again. For most pathologies, and, and what this tells you is most of these are well differentiated pathologies or the Lamin type pathology. A CC0 and a CC1 are pretty much equivalent. Um, and it's when you can't get all the tumor out is when your overall survival deep. So again, this is critically important when you're deciding on histology. Um, for a low grade, that's why we said that the low grade, the well differentiated, basically any of them benefit, even if you can't get it all out. Um, get to a one that's probably more optimal, but those high grade ones, we saw those curves where the CC1 was closer to the CC2s. Um, that means that you're really, you really have to get all that disease out for those high grade patients to benefit. 
So here's some data for quality of life. And um, I think this is um, pretty profound. And um, the study population is in the blue line. The referent population is the, is the yellow line there. Um, and basically this is their sort of global quality of life. You see that it dips down, um, but then it bounces back after about a year. We sort of dig down a little bit deeper. These are the sort of physical scores and the, the asterisks here show you that it's different from, from the referent baseline. And notice that it basically doesn't return back to baseline until after a year later. So this is 18 months. So it's here, the data suggests it's at least a year before they get back to their baseline. Emotional, they, they kind of do better over time actually. So emotionally they bounce back relatively quickly from the quality of life. But again, this operation wears you out. So fatigue scores, so here higher is worse, so lower is better. You can see their fatigue scores are up. And again, it's a year later that they're still, we're still having measurable declines in their quality of life after this operation. GI complaints, nausea, vomiting. You can see here, it, it's for two years afterwards. It sounds like, it feels like their gut doesn't work. And I believe it. Again, this is a big operation, the consequences of which are real the long-term effects are measurable, apparent. However, we help these patients and their pain scores get better. They get better over time. These patients are miserable when they come into your office. Um, having carcinomatosis, having a distended jelly belly full of fluid, full of muses, not being able to eat. Abdominal girth is increasing, but you're losing weight. You can't figure out why. It is a miserable, miserable experience. Um, and, and they benefit almost immediately from that, and they have uh, continued prolonged benefit from that over time. So certainly what we need to do um, in the future, randomized trials to determine optimal cytoreductive surgery and hypeknic technique. This is certainly, it's the wild west out there. Um, you can tell, you know, where somebody trained by how they do a hypec basically. Um, and nobody really knows what the right thing to do is, how important the shaking is, how important the Duration is there was a trial out of Europe that looked at HIPEX for colon cancers, which basically showed no difference, no benefit to HIPEX. Um, and, and, you know, people are trying to extrapolate that to appendiceal, which I think is wrong. But then people are trying to nitpick about whether the, the technique they used is different than the technique is here. I think we have to be a little bit honest with ourselves. I don't know if it really matters if we shake for 60 minutes or 90 minutes. I don't know how important the, the heating is. Um, but like most things, you know, there's a lot of inertia with how we do things, and so change is going to be hard. Um, we certainly need to learn more about this. Tumor markers are helpful, but there's always a need for better biomarkers to assess disease prognosis, response, and surveillance. And I, I do think, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing with how I survey these, these low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms. Uh, I get a feeling that I'm probably following them a little bit more aggressively than some people do. Um, I, I don't know what the right answer is. Uh, I, we know that some of them do come back. We know the majority of them don't. What the most rational cost-effective way to do this is, I'm not sure. Um, a lot of people are using MRI, which saves people, you know, radiation exposure and some think it's a little bit more sensitive. So I've kind of, for my long-term patients, I've been switching to MRI. Um, that's one strategy. I don't know if that's the right strategy, but that's, that's an option. So with that, I was able to leave some time for some questions and be happy to do so. Well, thank you, Dr. Egger. It was a fantastic uh, talk about a complex topic and these are common questions on uh, board exams and abcite exams and uh, maybe uh, you've got a couple of points for some of our trainees. They paid attention. Um, yeah, it's my observation that HIPEC, which uh, a couple decades ago was a pretty uncommon procedure, uh, has kind of exploded, and that um, some driven by industry, some driven by uh, more data showing benefit. But I mean, as you described, uh, there is a desperate need for level one evidence. Um, in, and you have pretty good evidence where, where, it, where it benefits patients with uh, low-grade endocell mucinous neoplasms, and, uh, and, and certainly there's uh, 
some controversy in many areas, as you've described at the end here, that the not always easy to know if you're doing the right thing, and patient selection is absolutely the most important part of uh, the procedure because the morbidity and potential mor uh, mortality is, is substantial. So if you do this, you want to be sure you're, you have a pretty good chance the patient might benefit from it. Um, and so I, I think there is a ample opportunity for, for clinical trials to help define the role of uh, this procedure and the best patient selection. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. like you talk to the fellows, you know, kind of from my my class onward, a lot of people are being asked to start high PEC programs. I don't know why. I don't. They're they're the the finances must work out, but everybody's being asked to start high PEC programs. It's fascinating to see, um, and I, you know, as long as we're not expanding the ind indications for it, I don't think it's unreasonable to be able to offer this. You know, the high PECs, you know, traveling to a high volume center, I think, is really important for a lot of operations. Um, the, you know, a high pec operation though that is a three to six month recovery, and it is it is not the operation to fly in, get your operation, and fly home two weeks later. And so, I talk to my patients about that when they ask about going to other places, and I always encourage them to go to get second opinions and things like that. But I I do caution them that this is a big recovery, and you don't you don't want to be staying in a townhome in some strange city for six months because you might be after this operation. Yeah, and and uh, there certainly is pressure in, in starting a high pec program to have patients, and I think part of the problem is that the criteria for patient selection get uh, loosened a little bit. Dr. Scoggins, Phillips, or others want to comment or ask questions? Dr. Galandiak, I see. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I recently got a paper from Dr talking about a group of patients actually with a five-year cure. So we have to, uh, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of selection bias where we're sadly as surgeons sent these patients very late. Uh, and I think it's very important as surgeons for us to continue follow, to follow patients that we see so that we can s see some of these patients when they're still amenable to this type of treatment. And very, very important for us to keep this as a treatment in mind. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice it's to see nice them to early in their diagnosis too. I mean, a lot of times you'll see them, you know, analogous to our colorectal liver metastases, you'll see them after getting beat up with six months or 10 months of chemotherapy and they're not fit for a haircut, let alone a high pack. And yeah, I, I agree. It's, 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 I think it's good to see these folks and get involved in their, in their education as far as what to expect. Dr. Egger, that was a great talk. Um, I've been impressed with the number uh, of patients who will have a appendiceal carcinoid tumor who have several nodes uh, that are positive when they get the right colectomy and over time develop radiographic evidence of carcinomatosis from their carcinoid. And uh, I've been I've hurried up and done done nothing with most of those patients uh, because of the slow nature of that disease. Do you have any thoughts on whether we should be offering folks like that more aggressive cytoreductive surgery? I don't think so. I think I think you're right to follow those patients for a while, right? And and try to. I think it is a game of chicken, though, right? You're kind of following them and you're trying to give them as long as possible. Um, but, you know, I think the biology drives things, right? And I think what do we always say for carcinoid? Everybody deserves one good debulking, right? Whether that's a liver debulking, a peritoneal debulking, something like that. And so I think if the disease becomes symptomatic, if they, um, if you're trying to get them off a of therapy or something like that, there's probably a role in the right patient for a debulking. Um, we don't have any good evidence to perfuse those patients, right? And, and um, I'm less and less enamored with perfusion. I think the... Um, the European data for colorectal has freed us a little bit from being obligated to perfuse those patients, which is great, because um, I think the perfusion adds a lot to the morbidity of this operation. Hey, Mike, this is Prajesh. Great document. Um, so 
every now and then you'll get a patient with uh, with pseudo mixed that you can't clearly tell where it's coming from, right? Uh, in a in a female with without clearly visible ovaries or ovaries that are just borderline abnormal in ultrasound with an appendix that's either not visible or is just only slightly you know fluid filled. What's your approach in those patients? Because they, those have been a little tricky to deal with. Yeah, I mean. To me, it's 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 almost like uh, it just sort of depends on whose office they go to, right? Like if they end up, they'll they'll either end up in the GYN oncologist's office or our office, and 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 we'll we'll treat them like an appendiceal primary. They'll treat them like a GYN primary. Like it's sort of like if you have a thora- you know esophageal cancer and you go to the surgical oncologist or a thoracic surgeon. It, it's I kind of favor them more like appendiceal. I mean. Some people have said basically that ovarian and appendiceal are all the same kinds of cancers. They're basically just peritoneal surface cancers. Um, and so that can be tricky. And then a lot of times we'll just work together with them, right? And the, the decision, um, GYN oncology is starting to use HIPEC a little bit more, but they they like the, the EPIC, the, post, the post-op the post for um, intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So it kind of, honestly, kind of depends on who gets to them first. <laughs> Uh, Mike, can you just make one last comment on pressure, pressurized intraperitoneal chemotherapy? I know there are some U.S. trials doing that right now. Right, and so that's that's again, it's does the technique work, right? Do some of the technical matters of of a, of a, of, a, of, a, of a perfusing of perfusing under pressure to try to disseminate, try to get more surface contact and things like that to eliminate these pockets? Um, we'll see. I'm up for you know, we're up for trying for anything. I think for some of these things. Well, thank you, Dr. Egger. It was really a terrific uh, grand rounds and a lot of, uh, of useful information for everybody. We all learned something, I believe, and uh, let's go on to our QI conference.